This is the second in a series inspired by Pilgrim's Progress that is a pilgrimage that you are invited to participate in. Our pastor, John Kenny, will be doing a sabbatical uh, over the next months inspired by Pilgrim's Progress, and we as a congregation are inspired, in, invited to join John on his pilgrimage through a message series and through our small groups and our equipping hour. So I hope you're able to join us. If you haven't yet, it's not too late. You can still get a free copy of Pilgrim's Progress on the information table and follow along with us through a reading schedule and, uh, and participate in these messages. So last week we began our pilgrimage with um, Christian, who is the pilgrim in the story Pilgrim's Progress, written by John Bunyan, published in 1648 in England. And in the story, uh, Christian discovers a book that he reads, and he discovers that there is a burden of sin on his back that he bears, and furthermore, that um, the place where he lives is um, because of the judgment of God against sin, not just his own, but everybody else's as well, is destined for destruction. So this compels Christian to go on a pilgrimage, which is uh, shown to him by a character called Evangelist. And Evangelist um, sets him on the road of pilgrimage uh, toward uh, a narrow gate, it's called the Wicket Gate, and um, there's a, a light that kind of reveals the location of the gate, and, and Christian is uh, to, to go to that place and enter through that gate and then continue on his pilgrimage. So, uh, Pilgrim sets out on this uh, journey, and along the way he meets a character called Worldly Wise who suggests to him that there is an easier way to offload that burden that he's bearing and he sends him on an alternate route uh, toward the village of morality and on the way a Christian is confronted with the mount of legality and it is insurmountable and it is a frightening place and Christian fears for his life. Evangelist reappears and, um, and strongly admonishes Christian that he has taken a wrong turn and that he needs to get back on the right path and proceed his way to the narrow wicket gate that uh, he originally directed him to. So Christian uh, about faces, he follows his uh, steps back to the, the right path and finds himself at the wicket gate. And that's where we take up the story today. Christian uh, approaching the wicket gate. And there he, uh, he is welcomed and encouraged to step through the narrow gate and then continue on his journey. So uh, a number of events and um, characters uh, show up in the story from this point forward. And I would like to just cover some of those um, and, and see if it impresses you the way that it did me that there, there seems to be kind of a conflicting message going on here, some uh, dynamics that, um, that show that Christian's journey is determined by God's grace and mercy and his ultimate arrival at the celestial city, the ultimate destination, is by God's grace and mercy. But on the other hand, it also seems to depend on what Christian, the pilgrim, either does or doesn't do. And at some point, it seems like these two are almost, um, well, maybe contradictory to see if it, it strikes you that way. So first of all, we have um, when Christian arrives at the wicket gate, a character named Goodwill who uh, opens the gate for him and helps him, pulls him through, in fact. Uh, with great vigor, and and it would demonstrate sort of well, this is God's grace, and and goodwill even says, hey, um, anybody, anybody, regardless of what he may have done in the past, is welcome to come through this gate. 
Um, and it, it, it is God's grace that allows him to do so. However, you know, previously we, we observed that Christian uh, had to go quite a ways with this, this burden on his back, and it was his effort that brought him to this place. Now, um, fo immediately following that, Goodwill reviews uh, Christian's detour to the Mount of Legality and basically, again, affirms, just as Evangelist did earlier, that that is the wrong way. You will not get to the celestial city via the village of morality or the Mount of Legality. So he thoroughly... Um, admonishes Christian that, look, uh, you're not going to get to the celestial city by obeying the law the, at the Mount of Legality. As a matter of fact, it's a mountain that you, you could never climb. So you don't get to the celestial city by obeying the laws. It's not the works of obeying the law that get you to the celestial city. And then he says, and you follow this straight path to the celestial city. But then it's pointed out that uh, there are many side roads and detours and hazards and dangers along this straight path that require Christian to persevere, to keep pushing forward, to not take the wrong path. So it would seem to indicate there that it depends on things that Christian either does or doesn't do. So there are side paths. Um, it seemed to me, as I was reading through Pilgrim's Progress, that once Christian got to the wicked gate, the narrow gate, and once he entered through, he'd be relieved of his burden. But in fact, he wasn't. He had to continue to carry that burden. Um, and, and finally, finally then arrives at the cross where the burden is removed from him, almost of its own will. At the cross, Christian sheds his burden, but he doesn't do it. It's done for him. So this is an act of grace, and surely at the cross, if anywhere, we see the grace of God exhibited um, by what Christ did there our sins are relieved from our shoulders, taken on his, and he bears the burden of our sin. And that is all God's grace. We didn't do anything to deserve that. Um, so we see grace at work there in the story. Well, now Christian... Uh, proceeds on to a place called the House of the Interpreter, and he sees various rooms and characters in the House of the Interpreter. And there uh, he comes across a parlor that's full of dust. And uh, somebody comes with a feather duster and tries to clean the dust up, but it just stirs up the dust and makes it even worse. But then somebody else comes with water and cleans the room with water and that collects and settles and removes the dust from the room. So here we see that it, and the water represents the grace and mercy of God. And the feather dusting is just efforts to try to deal with the dust on our part. So here we see grace and mercy at work again. Next, we see two children playing, patience and passion. Um, passion is a child who is impatient and wants everything now and is gifted with, with uh, blessings, but then squanders them and in and, and the end has nothing. While patience waits quietly and patiently for the good things that are yet to come, whereas passion indulges in uh, what is available now. So, so worldly passions uh, are the focus of, of the passion child while patience waits for something better, eternal blessings. Well, here again, we see something that would seem to indicate that, uh, you know, you need to make the right choices and that's on you and you decide. Do you squander your life uh, on, on worldly um, 
passions or do you wait patiently for God's blessing? That's a, a work that you or a choice that you would be forced to make. Next, we come in a room with a fireplace and we see somebody uh, trying to douse the fire with water, but back behind the fireplace, almost unseen, is somebody fueling that fire. And it's interpreted as Satan is the one who wants to put the fire out, but Jesus is behind the fire, fueling it so that Satan cannot put it out. This would indicate to us uh, the grace of God at work um, in spite of the efforts of Satan. Further on, there is a, a palace beautiful that uh, Christian would enter. However, there are guards at the palace door who are ready to do mortal harm to anybody who would try to enter. And basically a battle must ensue in order to enter through uh, into that palace beautiful. So this would indicate that uh, you know, you have to go through, and I believe the scripture there was, you have, must go through trials to enter the kingdom. Um, this is something you have to do. This is something where a Christian takes on the, the, the battle, and, and it's a work that he does to enter into the palace. And then finally, uh, further on, we see two uh, characters, formalist and presumption, climbing over the wall rather than entering through the narrow gate. And they are interpreted as those who would enter into the kingdom of God in some other way than through the narrow gate, basically by their, by their works. And um, they're, they're admonished by Christian that they, you know, they, they must enter through the narrow gate. Otherwise, it's um, illegitimate for them to be there. And then, uh, you know, that basically uh, there is a way of grace that is available to you. And uh, here uh, Bunyan pro uh, quotes the book of Galatians and admonishing that it is not by the law, but by grace that we enter. And they've entered through in some other way by climbing over the wall. And that's the wrong way to go. And then later on, we see them taking uh, the wrong turn on the roads of danger and destruction. So again, here we have, along the way, uh, possible wrong choices that could be made and the, the, the uh, consequences of making those wrong turns, those wrong decisions on the part of the pilgrim uh, are danger and destruction. So, long story short, uh, a big um, question that has arisen in the Christian faith almost from the very beginning uh, was the question of uh, our salvation. Is it by strictly by God's grace and mercy and us believing in that? Or is it by things we either do or don't do, choices we make? Is it by grace or is it by works? And this is a conversation that's been going on since the beginning of the Christian church. Well, you might ask, as we did last week, because we're not preaching Pilgrim's Progress, we're actually preaching Scripture. So how does all this align with Scripture? Well, actually, um, th quite well. I, and there are many, many passages in Scripture. Last week, I left off with one Scripture passage where both grace and works are, uh, are present. In, in one very short passage. It's from Galatians 2, 8 through 10. Um, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. And then it goes on to say, and you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So, so far we have grace and works. This is all what God has done. You are created by God in Christ to do good works which he has prepared in advance for you to do. So we have grace and mercy juxtaposed with works right there in one verse, one very short passage. And that's not the only place. There are many places all throughout scripture where the two interplay with each other in ways that um, are either interesting or confusing or perhaps perplexing for something that, that matters as much as this. So another, another example in scripture is the... Um, Abraham. Now, Abraham was a patriarch that lived in around 1500 BC, and uh, God came to Abram and made promises that 
if uh, he would make him a great nation and bless him and all the nations of the earth would be blessed through Abram. Ultimately, that promise was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And he was considered the father of our faith and considered to be righteous. Uh, now, the book of Hebrews basically says this, that Abraham was made righteous, was justified, not by works, but by, by believing. What then shall we say? That Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter. In fact, Abraham was justified. If Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So in other words, Abraham was made righteous, not by anything that he did, but by believing what God said he would do, believing God and believing what, that God would do what he said he would do. And that's what made him righteous before God. Now, James, in his book in the Bible, uh, says this about Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you, do you see that faith was working together with works and by works faith was made perfect? You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. So these two seem to almost contradict each other. Same story, same person, different uh, interpretation. Hebrews basically saying that Abram was justified by believing God, he was made righteous. James saying, well, yes, and what he did. So book of Romans, uh, where Paul uh, exegetes the gospel and our faith in Christ. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. So same language as talking about Abraham. If we don't work, but we trust God, then we receive the righteousness of God as a gift. But in the same book, Romans 2, Starting at verse 6, God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. So right there in the same book of Romans, it seems to be saying two different things. Um, there are, there are so many others. Um, Romans 8, what, what, I cons what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as my Savior, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God, on the basis of faith. So here again, in Romans, we see uh, affirming righteousness by faith, not by works. But striking contrast to that is the parable of the sheep and the goats. If you're familiar with that, it says that at the judgment, God will uh, gather all people and he'll, he'll separate them like a shepherd shep separates sheep and the goats. And the basis of that separation is those who saw people in need and helped them and people who didn't. So it appears that in this parable, here's how Jesus finishes this. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. And to these people, the king will say, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. So the people who do these things receive that blessing. So it, there, are, there are so many scriptures. There's a, a striking phrase in the book of Hebrews that talks about the nation of Israel and how they failed to enter the promised land the first time they had the chance. And 
basically that's used as an example for how we should persist in entering into the promises of God. And it, it's summarized in this phrase, let us therefore make every effort, works that we do, to enter that rest, which is the grace and mercy of God. So almost a paradox, both in Pilgrim's Progress and in Scripture. So what to do? It seems like there, here are two things that, um, if not contradictory, certainly very different from each other and seem to be heading off in different directions. How do we reconcile? How do we integrate? How do we deal with that? Well, the church has had 2,000 years and, you know, a, a lot of tradition has been established around the issue of works and grace. One of them is by, to say that, well, yeah, we're saved by grace and by works. You know, that's what really saves us is grace and works. Uh, James is probably the one who says that most clearly in his book, uh, James 2, starting at verse 14, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says, go in peace, keep warm, be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith itself without works is dead. Famous saying from the book of James, basically that you need to combine your faith with works, otherwise it's as good as dead, it's nothing. A second way that the church, uh, this is, kind of a, a development within the Catholic Church is that the, uh, you're saved by grace and, uh, and by making use of the means of grace, the means of grace being the sacraments. And the Catholic Church has seven of them. And in, by doing penitence, uh, penance, you, uh, you receive forgiveness. So it's faith and uh, making use of the means of grace, which is kind of a works thing. And then in time that evolved to that the church leveraged that uh, means of grace, of which it was the sole giver, the church and its formal sacraments were the means by which grace was given to the Christian. And they would leverage that for financial gain to help build their cathedrals. This was part of what the reformers rebelled against when, uh, during the Reformation in the mid-1500s. And they very much emphasized that, that God's grace uh, through faith is, is the only way to salvation, not by works. Another perspective is that uh, we're saved by grace, but our works are... are uh, create eternal reward, treasures in heaven. Jesus himself uh, commended storing up treasures in heaven. Maybe you remember that from Matthew 6. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Well, how do you do that? Um, Jesus speaks further in that passage, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So another way that grace and works have been um, explained or uh, taught is that, well, yes, you're, you're saved by grace, but you're rewarded for your works, and that there, the, some of those uh, rewards are eternal not just um, in this life. Well, another way, uh, and this, this was a fa um, particular favorite of reformers uh, in the reform movement, was that <clears throat> we're saved by grace through faith, period, and then good works are what we do out of gratitude to God for uh, our salvation. We aren't working for salvation, we're working from salvation. And uh, the parable of the unmerciful servant is kind of a negative example of, um, of this, where you know, a servant was forgiven a huge debt which he could never repay, 
Uh, then the assumption was that he would then treat his fellow servants the same way. When he doesn't, then uh, you know severe punishment falls upon him. But the implication is that um, if God forgives us a huge debt that we could never repay, then we're um, we're obligated to uh, to be grateful and to do likewise. Well, I'd like to add just one more, which um, is similar to that. Um, some critics say, look, uh, people, even people that are Christians, aren't that virtuous. They just won't. Uh, you know, they just won't express their gratitude uh, the way that they should. And, you know, so, so um, you know, that's, that's not a, you know, out of, good works out of gratitude does, just doesn't work that often. But there is a similar um, motivation, I think, for good works. And I would call this uh, compelled by love, compelled by love. So, what, what God reveals in Scripture and through the, the life and death of Christ is his great love for us. While we were yet sinners, uh, God demonstrates his love for us in this, that Christ died for us. So um, there, there is just this, this compelling love. As for us, we were dead in our tres trespasses and sins. There was nothing desirable about us. There was nothing that we uh, were capable of doing, inclined to do. There, there, was, there was no reason for God to love us other than that God chose to love us and did that for us in Christ and demonstrates his love for us by taking on our sin, taking on the punishment of our sin, setting us free from slavery to sin and uh, paying back a debt that we could never pay. And I think scripture's best answer to the grace and works paradox is that um, we recognize that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, but God uh, raises us up. We are resurrected to a new life. Um, we are inhabited by the Holy Spirit. Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. If we really perceive the weight of our sin that it has, it, it, it has caused us to be completely undesirable, but then God comes and loves us, knows us thoroughly, recognizes that sin, loves us anyway, saves us, gives us eternal life, comes to us and dwells with us through the Holy Spirit. My goodness, if that love just doesn't impress your heart. Um, you know, that the scripture says, uh, I, I pray that you would have power together with all the saints to grasp how long and wide and high and deep is the love of Christ, to know this love that surpasses knowledge, to be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. How could we do anything other than to imitate that love, to, to uh, share that love with the people around us, the world around us? It is absolutely compelling. In one passage, the Apostle Paul recited all the hardships he had been through how he'd been oppressed and arrested and beaten just short of his life and shipwrecked and he'd suffered hardship and difficulties for, for decades. And then you know, he said, but Christ's love compels me. Christ's love compels me. So I believe that if the grace has done its work fully in us, that it is compelling, absolutely compelling. You are compelled to want to love God and love people. And this is the great commandment. This is what the prophet said, that a new covenant would come, that God would impress his laws on our hearts. Not, it wouldn't be an external thing uh, written on stone that is required of us. It would become the desire of our hearts to love God and love people. And Jesus said, look, all the law and the prophets hinge on this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love others as you love yourself. And that law 
through the gospel, through the grace of God, is impressed on our hearts and then becomes our guiding motivation in life. How can I bless God and bless other people? All right, now moving along in Pilgrim's Progress, we, still in the House of Discernment, I believe, we meet a man in a cage. And this is a very sad story here. Uh, it is revealed to Christian that this man was once a, a pilgrim, a Christian, a believer, just like Christian is, but that he had given in to his carnal desires and indulged in sin and had done so deliberately and um, perhaps for a long period of time and is now stuck in a cage and can never get out. Here's part of the dialogue. Uh, Christian asking the man in the cage, do you have any hope that you will not be kept in this iron cage of despair? The man's eyes stared at the floor again. No, none at all. But why? Don't you know that the son of the blessed is very merciful and compassionate? <clears throat> the man in the cage said, I have crucified him again by my life. And then uh, he quotes Hebrews 6 here. I'll read more of that later. I have despised his person. I have despised his righteousness and regarded his blood as an unholy thing. I have acted spitefully to the spirit of grace. But can't you repent and turn from this despicable condition? The man shook his head slowly. No, for God has denied me repentance. Well, here's a very sobering picture of a man who once knew God's grace, but um, despised it and apparently to the point of no return. So this brings up uh, another big question in, in the, um, the Christian faith. Uh, the, the phrase that's usually used to describe it is called eternal security. Uh, if, if we are saved, are we saved um, for good or is it possible to lose the grace that God has given us? Now this is based on, on Hebrews 6, um, and here's part of that, Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. So basically, uh, based on this passage in Hebrews 6, uh, John Bunyan introduces this character of the man in the cage who has despised God's grace to the point of no return. Well, that's sobering. And I wonder, uh, as many have, is... Is that right? Because there are other scriptures that, that seem to say other things, even referenced earlier in uh, Christian's journey on his pilgrimage when he entered the wicked gate. Um, John 6, 37 is a proof text there. All those the Father gives me, this is Jesus speaking, will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Um, and then... It is, um, it, in other passages in John, it says that, that those who are in the hands of God cannot be snatched out. Uh, and there are other passages that seem to indicate that uh, once you are saved, you're always saved. So uh, then we have uh, also on, in Pilgrim's Progress, when Christian uh, comes to the cross. He is, um, one of the things that happens is that there is a seal put on his forehead. And here we, he quotes Ephesians 3, in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, have also believed you are sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. There is a seal placed on uh, Christian's forehead. And, and seals cannot be undone. Uh, once a, a king makes, gives his word, it can't be undone. So there are passages that, that seem to say other things. Here's that passage in John, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. 
My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. So again, two seemingly different messages. One that is possible to sin beyond the point of no return. Others that say that it just can't happen. So which is it? Well, let me just give a little perspective. In the book of Hebrews, the example of the nation of Israel after they were led out of the wilderness or led out of Egypt into the wilderness by Moses. And then uh, after a couple of years, they arrived at the border of the promised land, which God had promised to Abram 400 years earlier that the descendants of Abram, now the nation of Israel, would live in this promised land and they were about to enter in but because the uh, obstacles looked too great, there were great walled cities, there were many people living in the promised land. Uh, most of the nation of Israel uh, became fearful and sort of rebelled against their leadership and said, nope, we're not going to go. And so there is a warning issued in the book of Hebrews that says, don't be like them. Because of their unbelief, because of their lack of faith, they failed to act and go into the promised land as God was leading them and they rebelled. And because of that, they failed to enter the rest, the promise that God had given them. And they died in the wilderness. So this passage that speaks of uh, sinning beyond the point of return references the nation of Israel and their failure. And I thought, yeah, that's a pretty convincing story and it sure should, would seem to indicate that it's possible to sin your way out of God's grace. But then something occurred to me. Moses led them through the wilderness for 40 years. And occasionally on the way he got frustrated. And one time he lost his temper and he was supposed to simply touch a rock and water was going to come forth out of it to provide for uh, the people. But Moses lost his temper and, and, and beat it with his rod. And because of that, Moses, ironically, had spent the last 40 years leading these people who could have entered 40 years earlier, but because of their unbelief and lack of faith, didn't, um, and it was deferred to the next generation. Moses also was called and separated out by God, brought up to a mountain where he could see the promised land, but because his actions were displeasing to God, he saw it, but he did not enter in. So, was Moses lost forever? Actually, that in passage indicates quite the opposite, that he was taken from there into the presence of God. So that's one perspective. Uh, it would seem to say that, sure enough, you can sin your way out of God's grace. But if this story is like a parallel, Israel didn't go in because of their unbelief and their rebellion, uh, but so did Moses. So, and we know Moses was, was welcomed into the presence of God at the end of his life. Um, another perspective. I once knew a man who was uh, a Christian. I believe he was a deacon in his church. And he was also having an affair with his secretary. And he spoke to me and said, um, you know, I'm just wondering, do you think it's possible for for me to lose my salvation. And uh, I knew what he was referring to, this very issue that we're discussing here right now. And I said, well, you know, there, there certainly are two perspectives, very, both of them very biblical on this. One is that you can't, and the other is that you could. But I'll tell you what, I don't think it's a good idea to do anything that would make you question. So, um, Here's the deal, that um, if, if the question is, 
where are the furthest out boundaries that I could go and still be in the grace of God? Um, that's a bad question. That is a question that indicates that you're heading in the wrong, you're facing the wrong way and you're heading in the wrong direction. So in regard to this question of eternal security and uh, you know, and John Bunyan clearly, uh, you know, interprets it as, yes, you, you know, you can sin your way out of God's grace. Um, there are scriptures that seem to say it both ways. But um, the way to orient your life is that at, at the heart of uh, the source of our life is our fellowship with God, which is possible through the grace of Jesus Christ. Hebrews says we may enter the holy presence of God boldly because of the sacrifice of Christ. Christ is the way into the presence of God where there is life abundant and unimaginable and holy, blessed, and good. That is our orientation if we're pilgrims, and I'd encourage you to navigate your life that way. Then this never really needs to be a question for you. And the answer is, well, um, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not worried about that. I'm, I'm set on finding my way into the ultimate blessing of God and one day arriving there uh, in his presence face to face. This is our destiny.